things I'm most looking forward to as my kids get a little bit older are family game nights. I, I enjoy board games and card games and things like that. I enjoy doing that with people, but for me, I kind of have this kind of little dream of how cool it would be you know, on Friday nights to get some pizza and then just do a family game night. We haven't done that a whole lot because our kids, the younger ones at least, you know, they're, they're too young for most fun games. Now, over the years, we've done some games for littler kids. I don't really enjoy them so much, but we've done some of that, and so, you know, we're, we're getting there. Some of the games that we've played in the past are examples like uh, Shoots and Ladders. You guys might be familiar with this. It's a game of chance, right? You get the little thing, you flick it, it spins, and then uh, you just move the pieces along, whatever it lands on, and if you get to a ladder, sometimes you can skip some rows. If you get to a shoot, it takes you down. It's all right, but it's not that fun, right? It's just a game of chance. Uh, another game that we've played before in the past is called Count Your Chickens. Uh, it's a cooperative game for children, which means there's no winner or loser. It's about teamwork. And so there's one unified goal, and they try to work together to either accomplish the goal or not, which is kind of lame to me, right? I mean, it takes the fun out of playing a game. Uh, the reason I want to play a game is because I want to beat somebody, and then after, I want to gloat about it. And I can't wait to do that to my kids. So we haven't really had a chance to you know, have a lot of fun with that game. I'm not usually interested in playing Count Your Chickens. Um, but over the last year or two, we've started to introduce some more complex games that take a little skill and thought and strategy. So we've introduced uh, Monopoly, at least for the older ones. We've done a little Connect Four. Um, we, my wife, her, one of her favorites is Mall Madness, right? So we've done some of that. I grew up with boys. So I first time I played that was when I was 36. It's okay. But either way, these are some of the games that we're starting to do, and I'm looking forward to more of them. One of the games we also bought not too long ago was the game of Battleship. You guys remember Battleship? Classic game. Uh, and most of us know how this works, right? You, you both have a board that you have your ships set up on, and you pick where you want your ships, and the other player doesn't know where they are. And the way it works is you call out coordinates. It's kind of random, at least. It, it, it combines a little bit of luck and a little bit of skill. It's not fully random, but I mean, you kind of call out the coordinates, and then if you get a hit, then you get strategic, right? You begin to think through where that would be, and it's strategic where you place them. And so there's a little strategy involved. But the whole idea, right, is that you're trying to sink the other person's fleet. And the way that you win at Battleship is by identifying the other player's a position, right? You've got to identify the enemy, and once you do that, you can plan your attack. So the game is all about identifying the enemy. And as I think about the game of Battleship, I can't help but think about how this, in some way at least, parallels the Christian life. You see, the truth is, this morning, if you are here and you are a follower of Jesus, and I want to clarify what that means. When I say follower of Jesus, I don't mean that you're someone who just goes to church. I don't mean you're somebody who grew up in the church. I don't mean you're somebody who follows the rules or tries to be nice or tries to pe treat people, other people well. That's not what I mean. What I mean by being a follower of Jesus, it means that you know that you are a sinner and that there's nothing you can do to climb your way up to God. Because of your sin, you stand before God as guilty. And, and, and because you know that, uh, you realize that there's nothing you can do to earn it, but you've also realized that Jesus Christ he actually came down to you. You can't go up to him. He came down to you and he died in your place on the cross. He died the death that you deserve and he lived the life that you could never live. And through faith in Jesus, trusting in Jesus, you now enter into relationship with God. And that's not now why you're a follower of Jesus. Because of what Jesus has done for you, you're trusting in that. That's what I mean when I say follower of Jesus. So if that's you this morning, you are a follower of Jesus, then I want you to know that you and I have a common enemy. In fact, we have more than just one common enemy. We have multiple common enemies. The truth is we have enemies, enemies in the Christian faith. They seek to drag us down and pull us under. And the only way really to try to live out this Christian life in a way that's fruitful and successful is by first identifying those enemies and then moving forward. And I believe that this morning, as we look at the book of 1 Peter, and we're wrapping up a series on this book, I think that Peter, the author, he wants us to realize that, that they, there is an enemy to our faith, more than one. 
and that we need to identify those enemies to know how to move forward in the Christian life. That's what he's trying to show us. So if you want to see that with me this morning, I encourage you to open your Bibles with me to the book of 1 Peter. We're in 1 Peter chapter 5. Uh, it's the last chapter in this book. If you don't know where the book of 1 Peter is, just go to the book of Revelation and then work your way backward. It won't be very far and you'll find uh, the book of 1 Peter. Uh, the book of Revelation is the last book of the Bible. So go to the end of your Bible and work backward. 1 Peter chapter 5. If you came here this morning, you don't own a physical Bible, the Bible in front of you, that's yours today. Take it with you. We'd love for you to have a Bible. Um, or if you want to use our mobile app, there's a built-in Bible there too. But whatever you do, 1 Peter chapter 5. And we are wrapping up a series on the book of 1 Peter called Hope for the Homesick. Now, some of you have been with us through the whole journey. This is week eight of the series, but if you haven't, it's okay. This message will still apply to you. Uh, basically, this series has been all about us examining the reality of life, right? Sometimes life is hard. Sometimes life is challenging. I don't know what your morning has been like. I don't know what your week has been like or your year, but life is filled with trials and tribulations and challenges. And this series is about looking at the reality of the fact that as Christians, even though life is hard, the Bible tells us that we were made for something more, that we were made for something better, that the challenges we face in life, these are only ever temporary. God has something better in store for us. There is hope for the homesick. That's what this series has been all about. And so whatever you're facing this morning, I just hope that you remember that the struggle, right, that you're going through, this will not last forever. This is only a season. Something better is coming. Something better is right around the corner. And that's what we learn in the book of 1 Peter. And so this morning we are wrapping up that series, very last chapter. And just to give you a reminder about this book, Peter is a guy, right, who is a follower of Jesus. In the stories of Jesus, he was the disciple who was a fisherman who said, I'm going to give up fishing. I'm going to follow this guy around. And now at this point in the story, Jesus has already died on the cross. He's risen from the dead. The years have advanced. And now Peter is a fixture in the church of Jerusalem. Uh, he's a leader in the early church. And he's writing a letter to a group of Jewish Christians who were living in Asia Minor. Okay, that's where modern day Turkey is. So he's writing a letter to churches. And what he does is he's writing a letter to a group of people who were living in really difficult times because Asia Minor was part of the Roman Empire. And at that time, Nero Caesar, who was evil and, and twisted and, and just terrible, he was the guy in power and he was often persecuting Christians. And so Peter is writing a letter to this group of people, all these churches, reminding them of everything that's going on. And in the first five verses of this fifth chapter, he reminds the church leaders about the importance of really, really working hard, laboring hard to shepherd the flock well. To shepherd the flock well. Well, now what's interesting about this is for Peter, this idea of shepherding a church was really important to him. If you remember at the end of the Gospel of John, if you've ever read it, it ends with Jesus rising from the dead. And after he rises from the dead, he goes around and he encounters different people and talks with them and meets with them. And one of the very last things that happens is he sees Peter and he says, Peter, let's get breakfast, right? So Peter is getting breakfast with a guy who was just dead. Now he's alive, right? And I imagine if you eat breakfast with a dead guy, that's going to stand out in your mind as a pretty significant day. And so Peter is having breakfast with the guy, this guy who died, rose from the dead. And then right after that scene, near the very end of the book, Jesus says something profound to Peter. He says, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yeah, of course I love you. And he says, okay, then feed my sheep. And he says again, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, I love you. He says, okay. Feed my sheep, tend to my flock. And again, he says, Peter, do you love me? And he says, Lord, of course I love you. You know that I love you. He says, okay, feed my sheep. Now, I imagine, right, if that's one of the last things that Jesus says before he ascends into heaven, that would be a significant moment in your life. That would be a defining moment. You would take those words to heart. If I was Peter, I would go, man, my life should be dedicated to tending the flock that God has entrusted to me. And I think that that's why in this letter, in 1 Peter chapter 5, he's writing now a letter to other churches. Peter is talking about the importance of shepherding because that's something that's gripped his heart. Jesus gave him the command, tend to the flock. And now he's speaking to pastors and leaders. He's saying, listen, you also need to tend to the sheep, feed the sheep. Do the very same thing that Jesus told me to do, I want you to do. 
And so Peter is giving them this command because the role of a shepherd is significant. It's important. If you are somebody who serves in a church as a leader or a pastor or somebody who's pastoring a group of people, it's a significant role. Shepherds are called to, to lead and to feed the flock. They're called to provide the spiritual needs in the body. And I, I just, you know, I want you to know that here at Frankenmuth Bible Church, as a pastor here, as part of a pastoral team, Man, we want you to know that we love you, we care about you, and we hope that you feel cared for. We hope that you feel shepherded here. I, I realize the church is kind of big, and sometimes that's hard to feel that, but, but we, we do love you. We do care about you. We do pray for you constantly. And what I just want to say this morning is that, you know, for all the people who are part of the leadership here, for the pastoral team, for myself, for Pastor Greg, uh, for Pastor Spencer, for our, our, our staff, our ministry staff, the people in FBC Kids, our support staff, right? All our, our lay leaders in the various areas of ministry they serve, all our elders uh, and, and other pastors who serve in that way. We, we really do desire your best and we pray for you often. If we know there's a need in the church, we pray for you by name. But what I would ask this morning is maybe you could consider, if you haven't already done this, to make it a regular rhythm in your Christian life to pray for us. I could use your prayers, and I know that our other pastors could use your prayers as well, or other leaders could use your prayers, because the truth is, ministry's hard. It wouldn't take much to really cause a major rift in the church. All it takes is one pastor or one main leader falling, stumbling into sin, and so we want you to pray for us and hold us accountable and, and be there for us as well. Just as we want to shepherd you, we want you to pray for us because it's so easy to stumble and to go astray. And that's not just true of pastors. That's true for all of us. You know how easy it is as believers for us to just veer off the wrong path? Uh, one of the things that often happens for all of us, right, is we tend to begin to, to, to take aspects of our life and we begin to elevate ourselves over what God has said or what others do. And that's one of the main reasons why Christians tend to stumble is because we begin to look at ourselves selfishly. And it's interesting, John the Baptist, he said, he wants less of him and more of Jesus. But in the Christian life, so often what we do is we begin to diminish the role of Jesus in others and we try to elevate ourselves, don't we? And that's one of the easiest ways for us to stumble and to struggle. And this is why in the book of 1 Peter, after talking about shepherding, he begins to talk about, Peter begins to talk about the importance now of humility. Notice what he says in verse five. He says, clothe yourselves, all of you, all of us, with humility toward one another. He says, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You see, God hates pride. Perhaps more than any other sin, God hates pride. He opposes pride. And there's a good reason for that too. Pride is the reason why everything has fallen apart in the world. I mean, just think about it. What happened in the garden? What was the root cause of sin that ended up affecting everything? It was pride. The scriptures say in, in Genesis chapter 3 that Adam and Eve, they show up to the tree of knowledge of good and evil that they weren't supposed to eat of. And it says that the woman saw that the fruit was, looked good for food. It was pleasing to the eye and it was desirable for gaining knowledge and wisdom. Right? It was something that was pride, was welling up in her heart. If I eat this, I'll be like God, she thought. And so Eve took the fruit and she ate. And then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Right? He's complicit in all this. The Bible is clear. They wanted to be like God. So they took of the fruit and ate. Which means that the very first sin in the garden was the sin of pride. This is why Adam and Eve rebelled. They wanted to elevate themselves. They didn't want God to be number one. They wanted to be number one. And so because of their pride, they rebelled against God. And this whole mess Started So pride is the root attitude that lies underneath and behind all sin. It's the root sin. And it's something that dwells in all our hearts. It's a desire to put our interests above everybody else's. And so listen, as a follower of Jesus, you don't need to look very far to find an enemy. I'm telling you this morning, it's not like enemies in the Christian life are hard to find. No, 
The first enemy that we need to identify is the enemy that lives right here in my heart and your heart. There is an enemy that lives within you. And Peter wants us to see this. He wants to draw our attention toward, number one, the internal enemy. There is an enemy that lives with inside your heart. Now, I want to clarify something right now because I think it's important for us to really understand the reality of what it means to be a Christian. As followers of Jesus, I want you to know, first and foremost, we have been saved from the penalty of sin. We've been saved from the penalty of sin. What I mean by this is when God looks at us, he no longer counts our sins against us because that record of debt that we've stored up before a holy God, that was dealt with at the cross. When Jesus hung on the cross, he said, it is finished. When he said, it is finished, he meant the payment for sin is complete. He's dealt with the penalty of sin at the cross. Sin was paid for. That penalty, instead of being placed upon us and us dying on the cross, it was placed upon Jesus who died in our place. He is our substitute sacrifice. He died in our place to take our penalty for sin. And in exchange for that penalty for sin that we gave him, that was placed upon Jesus. He exchanged his righteousness. So when God looks at us, he no longer looks at us as guilty and sinful in Adam. He looks at us and sees the righteousness of his son, Jesus. We've exchanged the righteousness of Christ, right? His righteousness for our sin. So the penalty has been paid. This is called the doctrine of justification. That's the technical word for it. It means that we have a standing before God where he looks at us and says, no, you're righteous because of Jesus. You're connected to Jesus. And so when I see you, I don't count your sins against you. Those men cast as far as the east is from the west. No, I look at you and I see the righteousness of my son. This is an amazing truth, an amazing reality for Christians, isn't it? You don't have to pay for your sin. If you're a follower of Jesus, he paid for your sin already. It's been paid in full. It is finished. And so the beauty of the gospel is that the penalty of sin has been paid for. We've been saved from the penalty of sin. But listen, we haven't been saved from the presence of sin. Not yet. We haven't been saved from the presence of sin. Even though the penalty of sin has been dealt with, the reality is because I'm still a fallen human being living in a fallen world, I still have sin that dwells within my heart that rises up and tries to drag me down. I still have sin in my heart and life that rises up and wars against my spirit. And this is where pride lives. It lives within you and it lives within me. And Peter is trying to warn us of the danger of the enemy that lives Within, pride is so dangerous. This is why he says now in verse 6, humble yourselves. Therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time, he may exalt you. Now, I want to pause for a second because I want us to remember something really important. Who is writing this letter? It's Peter. And when we think about the life of Peter, And we read about his story in the Gospels. He is somebody who we could say, yeah, he struggles with pride. I mean, just think about the story of Peter. He's the guy who stood up at one point when Jesus talked about everybody abandoning him and denying him. Peter said, no, I'll never deny you. And he says, no, no, Peter, you're going to deny me. It's going to happen. He says, no, I'll never deny you, Jesus. I'll die before I deny you. And what did Jesus say in response? He said, Peter, you have no idea what you're talking about. You're going to deny me three times, in fact, before the the rooster even crows. Well, you fast forward the story, what happens? Jesus, he's taken, he's arrested, he's beaten, he's taken into custody. And there Peter is at a distance, he sees and and realizes that Jesus is now going to stand trial and he's going to be uh, prosecuted, he's going to be condemned and killed. And so from a distance, Peter is fearful. And somebody sees Peter and goes, wait, weren't you the guy that was hanging out with Jesus? And what does Peter say? He says, I don't know what you're talking about. I never knew, I never knew that guy. I didn't know the man. They're like, no, no, you were the guy with him, weren't you? And he's like, no, no, I never did that. I never, never was around him. I had nothing to do with him. And once again, they ask him, aren't you the guy that was with Jesus? He said, no. And then what happens? The rooster crowed. And when Peter heard the sound of the rooster crowing, he remembered what Jesus had told him. He remembered how in his pride, he boastfully said, I'll die for you, Jesus. I'll never deny you. 
And yet he does. And in the story, it says that Peter left there and he wept bitterly. You see, Peter is not writing to us a command about humility from his ivory tower. Peter's not writing from this platform in which he's never struggled with pride. He's, he's, he's perfect when it comes to humility, right? He's, he's the most humble guy ever, and so he's writing to us because he's the expert. No, Peter is writing this to us because he's also struggled with pride. He probably still struggles with pride. The truth is, Peter is a recovering prideaholic. And he's writing to the church from a place of saying, listen, I've dealt with this in my own life, in my own heart, and I love you guys, and I want you to know that pride is not the way that God has called us to live. Peter's whole point here is that, man, if you want to elevate yourself and in the eyes of others and exalt yourself, then man, that's going to be your reward. When you make much of yourself and you hear the praise of others, that's your reward. But when you humble yourself in this life, you look forward to the reward of God. Peter wants to warn us of the reality of pride. This is why the Apostle Paul, he says, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought. Don't let pride consume your heart. Don't allow the enemy within to drag you down. Don't live in such a way where you're trying to make much of yourself so that you can hear people admire you and talk well of you and speak much of you. Don't live that way. Live to hear God and his approval in your life. Live in such a way that at the end of your life, you hear from Jesus, well done, good and faithful servant. This is the way we're to live. If we exalt ourselves now, that's all we have. But if we humble ourselves in this life and serve one another and love one another, then we're going to be exalted by God. This is what Peter says. If we want to honor God with our life, let's wage war against the enemy that lives inside of us. And the good news is we don't have to do it alone. We have the Holy Spirit living within us. We have God who's helping us to chisel away at the pride and sin that rises up in our hearts. And if if you notice as it continues, Peter now connects this idea of pride with anxiety. Now we might think, well, how do those things relate? Well, notice what he says. Talks about humbling yourself. And then he says, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Now, why would Peter connect anxiety with pride The truth is anxiety is something that many people struggle with, right? It's common. Anxiety is a real thing. It grips many of us. It's debilitating for some people. It affects so many people in the world. And while I'm not suggesting right now that I have the answer as to why maybe some of you struggle with anxiety. I don't know your life. I don't know your story. I'm not your doctor. I'm not a clinical psychologist. I can't diagnose you right now just from a distance. I don't know. But I do know that at least for many of us, this idea of pride, it's connected to our anxiety. Let me explain this here. You see, if in your pride, you think that you are in control of your life, if in your pride, you are the sovereign one, your life is is determined by what you do and what you decide, if your life is all up to you, then the reality is when trouble comes your way, when hardship comes your way, when difficulty comes your way, when trials come your way, when suffering comes your way, if you are the one who's sovereign and in control, then the burden of those things all rest upon your shoulders. Perhaps there are people right now in the room or online who are battling anxiety because you believe deep down in your heart that you're still in control. Listen, you aren't in control. You aren't sovereign. God is. God is in control of your life. You could walk out these doors right now and drop dead. You have no control of that. You don't know the beginning from the end. You aren't the author and sustainer of your life. God is. And so the reality is, you often put yourself maybe on the throne, and I struggle with the very same thing. Let's stop elevating ourselves to the position of God, and let's humble ourselves and realize God is in control. I don't have to burden, have this burden on my own shoulders. His yoke is easy, and his burden is light. If God is sovereign, if God is in control of my life, 
then he can shoulder some of the challenges and struggles that I face. I don't have to face that alone. I don't have to deal with that alone. I can give it to the Lord. I can cast my anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for me. He loves me. And so I don't know if this is helpful for anybody, but if you're someone who's battling anxiety right now, maybe you need to take a deep inward look at your life and your heart, and you need to realize, listen, whatever it is that's causing anxiety in your life, you're not in control. And that's okay, because God is. He can handle it. That's not just your burden to bear. God is willing to shoulder this for you. Cast your anxiety on him. He cares for you. And so this is what Peter says. The enemy that lives within us, pride that wells up in our hearts, it's a dangerous thing. And so we need to humble ourselves and live in such a way where we can't allow that pride to to win and take control. And we need to humble ourselves in such a way where we go, you know what, God, we're trusting you with whatever it is. I'm going to give you my anxieties and my burdens. I'm going to trust you for it. So this is the first thing that Peter wants us to see. The first enemy that we face in the Christian life is the enemy that lives inside of us. It's the internal enemy. But the next thing we need to see is we identify the next enemy. Number two, it's this, the external enemy. You see, there's more than just one enemy to the Christian life. It's not just the enemy that lives within inside us. There's another enemy. Notice what Peter says in the passage. He says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Now, if you're with us a couple weeks ago, you know that I briefly talked about the role of Satan in the world. I talked about uh, spiritual warfare a little bit. And the truth is, we live in a culture where when you start talking about the devil or you start talking about spiritual warfare, people kind of think you're a fruitcake, right? I mean, people are kind of like, this guy is weird. It's the culture we live in. We've been shaped by philosophy and by a worldview where we look at things and we see tangible stuff and and that's what we connect ourselves to. We don't often think about the fact that there's a whole other realm out there of a spiritual world. That's just sounds kind of weird to us and it kind of makes us nervous when we hear people talk about it like this is strange I don't want to hear about that but for us it's strange but for the biblical authors this was just a reality there are spiritual forces at work in the world all around us and the chief spiritual force that's evil is referred to as Satan or sometimes called the devil now it's interesting we often think of the word Satan as if that's his name oh his name is Satan actually the word Satan isn't a name. It's not a proper noun. It's just a noun. It's a Hebrew noun, which means accuser. And so a lot of people, scholars will often refer to him as the Satan because that's not his name. It's just that he is the accuser, the accuser of the brothers, of the faith. Uh, The word devil is actually a word I believe that comes from Latin, but I think it's connected to the Greek. It might even be a transliteration from the Greek. The Greek word for devil is diablos, and uh, which if you know Spanish, right, that's similar, right? It's it's all connected to Greek and Latin. Um, But that word devil is, again, just a, 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 a word. It's a noun. It's not a proper noun. It's not his name. It means something. It means accuser or attacker. And so this character... Whatever his name is, we don't really know much about him, honestly, but he shows up a lot in the Bible, even from the very beginning. He's the one, no doubt, at work behind the scenes when the serpent creeps into the garden and tempts Adam and Eve. Right? He's being influenced and affected by Satan. And then we read a little later that the Satan, it says, in the story of Job, he's walking around to and fro across the earth, and then he goes up to be with God, and they have a conversation. And Satan says, oh, I'm I'm off tempting people and harming people. And God says, have you considered my servant Job? He's an upright man. He's not going to stumble and fall and turn away from me. And Satan goes, okay, well, let me test him. So God says, have at it. Just don't take his life. Strange story, but then the Satan, he comes down and he ends up afflicting Job with all those hardships. That's what Satan does. He disrupts the earth. He disrupts people's lives. He causes problems. Satan is described as the god of this age. He's described as the prince of the power of the air. He masquerades himself as an angel of light. We know that Satan is a liar. We know that he's an accuser of the saints. We know that he is our adversary, our enemy, which is why Peter says that your adversary, your enemy, the devil... He prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. 
Now, what's interesting about this description, right? I don't know if you've seen many lions in your life. Um, I don't come across lions very often. Every once in a while, probably once a summer, I go to the Birch Run Zoo. Anybody ever go to that? It's pretty cheap. All the animals are in these big cages, so it's kind of a little weird, but either way, cool little place to walk around and bring the kids. And uh, I go there all the time, and every time I see the lion, he's always sleeping. He is not ferocious at all. He's asleep, and I'm, he kind of looks cuddly. And the kids, you know, are like, oh, it's a lion, like way back there sleeping in a corner. It's, it's okay. But we don't normally see the ferociousness of an animal like this. But if you were living in the first century, and you went to one of the Roman games, or second century or third century, you may encounter a lion. And you may encounter a lion who was attacking a human. That was part of their uh, festivities. You'd see a lion that's licking his chops with the blood of a human dripping from his mouth. I know there's no kids' classes, so maybe I should simmer down with the blood dripping. But either way, right? this is something you'd be familiar with. Now, especially if you were a Christian, you would be aware that at times throughout church history, the Christians were fed to the lions in the games. One of the early church fathers, a guy named Ignatius of Antioch, he was one of the apostolic fathers. He wrote a number of letters that we have today that are, are wonderful. Uh, he lived at the end of the first century uh, and then died in the beginning of the second century. He, according to Jerome, was somebody who ended up being fed to the lions in the Colosseum by the Roman government right shortly after this time. So it was common for something like this to happen. And so the truth is, for a, a person reading this, they would have an understanding of what a ferocious lion is like and what it can do to a person. And so this is the imagery that Peter's putting in their heads. But the interesting thing about this is throughout the course of Scripture, the Bible also says that one of the things that Satan does is he's, he's powerful at work behind the scenes in these nations. And so as the nations rise up and do evil things, Satan is often the one influencing them. These demonic forces are influencing the superpowers of the world, working behind the scenes, causing corruption and greed and evil in the world. And so when Christians would go to face a lion, the reality was the true lion behind them, Satan, was prowling around. That's his role. He influences governments. And so the truth is, we often face these enemies in the world, but the, the reality is there is a, a deeper, darker enemy behind the scenes working, prowling around when we face these earthly enemies. This is why Paul, he connects this whole reality about what we wrestle with. We often think that we're wrestling with powers in the world, but he says, no, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. See, this is the reality. We're engaged always in spiritual conflict. We don't see the spiritual side. We see the earthly side, but there's a spiritual side behind it. This is what Paul says. But thankfully, if we're a Christian... In Christ, we have the upper hand. This is why Jesus said he saw Satan fall like lightning because through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, Satan has been dethroned. The God of this age has been replaced with the God of Israel. Satan can no longer lay claim to the church. The power that he once held of keeping the nations blind, that's been broken through Jesus. And as the gospel advances through the church to every tribe, tongue, and nation, the spiritual blindness that people were once held to, that's now being broken open. And so we advance the gospel and we defeat Satan as we go. And so as followers of Jesus, we're now free. We've been redeemed. We belong to Christ. We're on the winning team, which means we can stand up against the enemy, as long as we hold fast to our faith in Jesus. This is the biblical portrait. This is why Paul, later on, he just says, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. This is why in the very next verse, Peter says this, resist him, resist Satan, firm in your faith. How do we resist the enemy? It's by clinging to our faith in Jesus. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. See, what Peter is saying here is we can stand firm against the enemy. And even though it doesn't, it doesn't mean that we're going to be impervious to any of his attacks. It just means we can stand up against it in our faith. And when we are under attack and we do go through suffering and we do go through hardship, the good news is we're not defeated by it. We're not destroyed by it. In fact, we're unified with other Christians around the world who also suffer for the name of Jesus. This is Peter's point. We can resist the evil one. James says a similar language. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. James 4, 7. 
And so we have victory over this enemy through Christ. We have the power to resist the enemy. And so this is the point. Now, as I begin to wrap this up, I realize that we've went through this message. We've talked about two different enemies. I want to bring you back for a second. What is Peter getting to in this whole passage? Well, the point here that Peter is saying is the reality is the Christian life is hard. Living for Jesus is not easy because the reality is when we live for Jesus, we face enemies. We face enemies inside and enemies outside our life. We face the enemy within, sin and pride and greed In the flesh, which wars against the spirit, we have to fight against that internal enemy, constantly battling against our flesh, which rises up. He also says there's an external enemy. We need to fight and battle against the external enemy by holding firm to our faith and advancing the gospel. And so the point here that Peter is saying in this whole chapter is, listen, the life of a Christian is never meant to be easy. If somebody shared Jesus with you and said, the moment you trust in Jesus, your life is going to be great, you're going to be happy, right? I've talked about before, there's a song my kids sing. Uh, there's a series of Christian tapes they would listen to when they're kids. And one of the songs would always say, I'm in right, out right, down right, uh, up right, down right, happy all the time. And it repeats that a bunch of times. It's really annoying. But then it says, since Jesus Christ came in and cleansed my heart from sin, I'm in right, out right, up right, down right, happy all the time. Well, the reality is we're not happy all the time. Life is hard. Don't believe the lie that the moment you trust in Jesus, your life is easy. No, Peter says, Your life will be filled with hardship and struggle. And there's a reason, because we have an enemy. We have more than one enemy. And I don't know about you guys, but as I begin to wrap up this message in this series, I I tend to think when I read a passage like this, you know what? I'm kind of sick of fighting. Anybody else out there a little bit sick of all this drama and challenge and strife? and hardship, and conflict in the world. Don't you kind of feel like some days, like, you know what? I'm sick of the struggle. I'm really over this. Why do we have to keep going through all this? I'm done fighting. But see, Peter, he wants to remind us, listen, no, hang in there. Keep moving forward because the struggle will not last forever. We're in the heat of the battle now, Peter says, because we're facing enemies all the time. But you know what? The good news is Jesus wins the war. And if we're connected to Christ and the struggles we face, they're only ever temporary. This is why he ends this letter, not the very end, but almost the end. He says, and after you have suffered a little while, I love this verse. I don't know how your life has felt so far. Maybe you feel like it's just going on and on and on and it's such a struggle. But listen, Peter says, after you suffered a little, he describes your life as a little while. I'm in my late 30s, and I feel like my life has went on for, you know, a long time sometimes. When I'm going through hardship, I feel like it just keeps going on and on and on. And maybe you're feeling the same way. But listen, your life is a little while. In the grand scheme of things, as we look at all of God's plans for all redemptive history, what you're going through now, it's just a little while. And after you've suffered a little while, it says the God of all grace who's called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. It says to him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. See, this is our hope. This is our confidence for the future. God isn't done with you yet. We started off the service singing the song, He's Not Done Yet. And man, that is so true. God is not done with you yet. Your story isn't over. There is confidence for the future. God has an incredible plan in store for your life. And so as I wrap up this message and series, I want to leave you with a very simple, big idea. Because the truth is, the world, our life, it's difficult. It's filled with struggle and challenge because we're strangers and sojourners and exiles. That's what Peter says in this world. But I want you to know that at the end of the day, the struggle is real, but it's not forever. This is the enduring message of this book. The struggle is real. I'm facing it. You're facing it. It's real, but it's not forever. So hear me. Don't give up. Don't give in. 
Don't throw in the towel. No, keep fighting. Keep pressing forward. Keep moving ahead because the truth is in Christ, there is always hope for the future. You can identify the enemy, the enemy who lives inside you and the enemy that's at work in the world. Identify the enemy. And then once you've identified the enemy, begin to go to battle. Day after day after day. As Paul says to young Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. Don't give up. Keep going. Keep moving. Keep fighting because the hope that we have is this. In the midst of our struggles, in the midst of our hardships, in the midst of our challenges, in the midst of the pain, we always know that there's hope for the future. There is hope for the homesick beloved. There's hope. And so don't let the struggles of the world keep you down. Yes, they're real. Yes, they're significant, but they only last a little while. The struggle is real. It's real, but it's not forever. There's hope for the homesick. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. We thank you for the incredible truth of your word and the gospel. It's something we can cling to in times of struggle and challenge and trial. And Lord, as I I think through just the reality of what people might be facing this morning, I don't know. I don't know every story, but I know the human story. There's something that's common to all humanity and it's struggle. It's just the reality of living life in a fallen world in a place that's not our true and ultimate home. And so, Lord, for the people who are going through relational challenges, for the people who are struggling with their kids, for the people who are having financial burdens, for the people who are having conflict at work right now, or for the people who are fearful about the future, for those who are sick right now and struggling and battling disease, for those who've lost those that they love, for those who are feeling lonely, for those who are feeling burdened, for those who are feeling depressed, for those who are battling anxiety, for each and every person who struggles. Lord, I pray that you would encourage our hearts through the power of your spirit with the reality that this is only a temporary struggle. It is light and momentary. And it's preparing for us an eternal weight of glory that far surpasses anything we're going through. And so Lord, help us to remember that the struggle, it is real. Yes, it's real. It's significant, but it's not forever. There's an end in sight. And we can cling to that. We can trust in that. We can trust in you for our life and for our future. And so we thank you. We thank you for the hope that you've given to every longing heart, every heart that desires more and better. We thank you that you will satisfy that longing. You will satisfy a heart that wants more because there's hope. There's hope for the homesick. We thank you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.